This lecture video talks about the notion of vendors, Mary, and reasonableness, as well as uh, good administration and the outer limits of legality. It is a crucial topic because the notion of vendors, Mary, and reasonableness appears to provide an opportunity whereby an aggrieved person can question the a decision of an executive uh, decision maker on the basis of what apparently uh, is a question regarding the merits of the decision uh, in, the, in the context of a judicial review. So as we know, uh, judicial reviews are meant to be limited solely to a, an examination of, uh, in relation to questions of law or the legality of a decision, uh, if we're speaking of judicial review, because uh, it is only in the context of a merits review, for example, with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal that uh, questions relating to uh, the merits of the decision and the way that evidence and facts may have been appreciated. Uh, these are subjects uh, that can only be reviewed in the context of a uh, merits review. However, In this lecture podcast, I deal with the topic on witness theory and reasonableness, good administration, and the outer limits of legality. The topic on witness theory and reasonableness uh, has some uh, importance in the, in the field of administrative law because it seems to suggest that even when an applicant applies for the judicial review of an administrative decision, seems to appear that uh, by using witness very unreasonableness of a decision as a ground for judicial review, it seems to open the possibility for a court to examine the merits of a decision. Because the argument being that a decision by an uh, administrative decision maker, uh, which decision appears to be very unreasonable, uh, in, in that case, therefore, uh, that can ground a, an application for judicial review and potentially uh, the setting aside of that decision or the quashal of that decision. So by looking into whether or not a, an administrative decision meets the threshold of what is known as witness very and reasonableness, it appears to suggest that the merits of that administrative decision can actually be examined even in the event of a judicial review, which obviously is done by the courts. And we know for a fact by now that the uh, evaluation or the re-examination of an administrative decision relating to its merits uh, is uh, exclusively the function of administrative tribunals or merits tribunals such as the Administrative appeal tribun Appeals Tribunal. And it is not for the courts in general to look into the merits of administrative decisions. But the notion of witness very unreasonableness seems to open the idea uh, that uh, decisions by uh, members of the executive can actually be examined on the basis of the merits, in particular if such a decision would meet the threshold or the standard of witness very unreasonableness. And so that would be the topic of this lecture podcast. Now let's review a bit uh, what we know about uh, judicial review. By now we would have known that uh, judicial review is limited and narrow, uh, and it focuses only on the legality or lawfulness of administrative decisions. So judicial review does not look into the merits of a decision. It does not look into the factual correctness of a decision. It does not look into whether or not a discretion that is granted to an administrative decision maker uh, was exercised properly. So even if a decision uh, is wrong on the basis of the appreciation of the facts, it is not for the courts to uh, re-examine the uh, factual correctness or mistake uh, undertaken by uh, administrative decision makers. So uh, judicial review therefore is limited and narrow because it focuses solely on the legality or lawfulness of administrative decisions. And the reason why 
uh, judicial review in general is limited and narrow is because uh, when courts undertake judicial review, courts actually do not act as an appellate body, but they do so only uh, as some, uh, in un by undertaking a supervisory role in the sense that uh, it is understood that courts will uh, supervise the exercise of powers by the executive to make sure that the executive, for example, in exercising its powers complies with uh, limitations as imposed, for example, by the Constitution or by the rule of law. So that if a decision of the executive or the action of the executive is unconstitutional or is against the Constitution or contravenes uh, wildly held principles concerning the rule of law, then it is uh, within the power of the courts to stop or uh, limit the, the, uh, excess, uh, the excessive uh, exercise of power by the executive or uh, the com its commission of unlawful acts. And so therefore, in those instances when judicial review might actually be available, the understanding is that uh, the judiciary should not seek to review the merits of administrative decisions because the merits of administrative decisions, whether a decision is actually correct on the basis of the facts, uh, is something that should solely belong to the executive because uh, According, for example, to the High Court and Attorney General, New South Wales versus Quinn, the merits of administrative decisions are for the repository of the relevant executive power and subject to political control for the repository alone. So courts do not exercise any uh, appellate uh, jurisdiction over the actions of the executive, but would, fo would, would, would focus solely on preventing the executive from exceeding the powers and functions that are assigned to it by law. Uh, in the case of Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited versus Redness-Berry Corporation, the, uh, the court also had an opportunity to explain the key points about judicial review. It said, uh, Lord Green, uh, the Master of the Ro Lords, uh, the Master of the Role said, that courts can only interfere with an act of executive authority if it be shown that the authority has contravened the law. And it is not to be assumed prima facie that responsible bodies like the local authority, or for that matter, administrative decision makers will, will exceed their power. So as a general rule, uh, courts will pursue irregularity of uh, official functions by the executive. Uh, in other words, what it means is that it will be up to an applicant to try to prove that uh, that the executive has acted in bad faith or has acted ultra virus, meaning beyond uh, the powers that were granted to it, or that uh, when the executive, for example, uh, undertakes an action or makes a decision, it will be up to the aggrieved to show that there was an anomaly or, or bad faith or fraud in the uh, actions or decisions of the executive. The courts will not presume any irregularity. On the other hand, the courts will assume that responsible bodies such as the executive uh, ex exercise their powers regularly and officially. Uh, the other, the other, uh, the other uh, key point that we know about judicial review is that the court, even when it is alleged that the local authority or the executive uh, has contravened the law, the court cannot substitute itself for that authority. So in other words, the court uh, is not in a position to substitute its own decisions for that of the authority. So the, the power of the court is limited solely to trying to set aside or quash a decision of the executive. And we're talking uh, in general terms because we do know that uh, there is a common law power and part of the courts to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction, or even equitable remedies such as uh, specific performance. But in general, we know that uh, as far as judicial review is concerned, the court is limited uh, solely to setting aside or quashing a decision of the executive, but certainly cannot substitute its own decision. Even if it felt that there is a proper decision, courts cannot substitute its own decision for that of the executive. And we know this as well from the, from the case of Green versus Daniels, which is uh, an Australian court. In, our, in undertaking judicial review, the court is not a court of appeal. Uh, we, we, this is important because 
uh, if the court were acting as a court of appeal, then a decision that is being reviewed on appeal can actually be examined by a court both on the basis of uh, a question of law as well as a question of fact. But because in undertaking judicial review, a court uh, is not acting as a court of appeal, uh, the function of the court is limited to a determination of whether or not uh, when an executive makes a decision or acts in a certain manner, the question is whether or not uh, it acted within the bounds of the law, and therefore whether or not uh, its actions or decisions may be uh, unlawful or contrary to law. And so courts cannot override a decision of the executive. It can, however, only set it aside or quash it. And uh, the focus, therefore, of judicial review uh, and by, of the courts in undertaking judicial review would be to see whether the executive has contravened the law by acting in excess of the powers which parliament, for example, has confided in it. And again, we should note that uh, the powers of the executive uh, are not limited to the statutory powers that are granted by the executive, but there are certain powers of the executive which we presume to exist on the basis of its being part of the executive. Now, these are known, for example, as prerogative powers. So the, 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 the courts uh, applying common law principles recognize that the, that the executive has certain uh, prerogative powers which it can exercise outside of any clear, clear statutory grant by the parliament. Uh, court, uh, if the executive also has... Uh, powers under the Constitution, such as in Australia, where there exists a written Constitution. But even where you have a situation, again, this is a matter of a, of a review somewhat, So, but even in a situation where there is no written uh, Constitution, just, such as in New Zealand and the UK, uh, the courts recognize that the executive does have uh, certain prerogative powers which, can, which it can exercise even in the absence of a statutory grant of authority by the, by the parliament. In um, Attorney General New South Wales versus Green, uh, Justice Brennan also indicated that there is, however, an extremely confined instance when the merits of a decision or action may be open to judicial review. So as we said, we know that judicial review is limited solely to the legality or lawfulness of an administrative decision it does not look into the merits of an administrative decision. But Justice Brennan in Attorney General New South Wales versus Green acknowledged that there might be an extremely confined instance where the merits of a decision or action of the executive may actually be open to the judicial review. And that is when the decision or action shows readiness, very unreasonableness. Uh, a phrase that comes from Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited versus Witness Berry corporation. Um, well, going to that case, for example, of uh, Witness Berry, of, of Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited versus Witness Berry Corporation, uh, what actually happened then was that the Court of Appeal was required to look into the actions of a local authority, which was the Witness Berry Corporation. It was a local authority, but uh, had a statutory grant of power. And um, it was empowered under the Sunday Entertainments Act of 1932, which was a UK legislation, to provide a license to cinemas so that they could open uh, on Sundays uh, with the permission of the local authority, which in this case was, was the Wednesday Corporation, and subject to such conditions that the authority takes fit to impose. Now, what happened in this specific case, for example, was that the plaintiff company, which was Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited, uh, sought permission from the Wednesbury Corporation um, to, to uh, open uh, its cinemas on Sunday subject to a condition that no children under the age of 15 years shall be admitted to any entertainment, even if they were accompanied by an adult. So uh, this was a case which happened in 1948, and presumably during that time, uh, it seemed to be against public policy uh, for children uh, below the age of 15 to be going to cinemas. And I wonder what the reason might be for that. But it could be like, you know, it could be that they're probably dating or they're wagging or doing all sorts of stuff in uh, movie houses. So it was like, you know, it could only be adults who could do uh, silly stuff in movie houses, but not 15-year-old uh, kids. So, uh, but uh, the Associated Provincial Picture felt that that was an unreasonable restriction on its ability to open its cinemas on Sundays 
because they felt that um, to be uh, to have children prevented from going to movie houses on a Sunday in a cinema, even in the presence of an adult, seemed to be an invalid and unreasonable. Uh, but although this specific case, the Court of Appeal of the UK at that time, uh, decided that there does exist a, a, uh, a ground for review concerning uh, the unreasonableness of the decision, which looked into whether or not the decision was actually reasonable or not. Uh, in this particular case, the UK Court of Appeal actually sided with, this, with the Witnessbury Corporation and dismissed uh, the, uh, the appeal of the uh, Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited and made a finding that the decision of the Wednesday Corporation in providing a restriction uh, on f children below the age of 15 in going to a cinema, even if accompanied by their parent or an adult, that this was a reasonable restriction. Now, so going back to uh, the notion of of uh, uh, witness very unreasonableness and the statement made by Justice Brennan in Attorney General New South Wales versus Quinn, it seems to appear that uh, the gate to judicial review on the merits of a decision or action taken within the power uh, is, is open. And so therefore, uh, witness very unreasonableness has been used as a general ground to attack the lawfulness of an administrative decision. And when you speak of the lawfulness of an administrative decision, you in that case, it's not just an examination of whether or not the decision uh, met the standards of law, but whether or not it was unlawful because the decision met the threshold of witness very unreasonableness, which was actually an attack uh, of the decision on the basis of the merits of the decision. So, uh, for example, in that specific case of Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited versus Witnessbury Corporation, Lord Green, Master of Rotherall, said that apart from bad faith, dishonesty, attention given to extraneous circumstances, disregard, and disregard for public policy, uh, and unreasonableness, these are matters which are relevant to the question of permissible grounds of attack. Therefore, uh, Witnessbury and reasonableness, which is the focus of this week's topic, has been recognized as a ground of judicial review at common law. Uh, in addition, there is actually a statutory recognition of witness of unreasonableness as a ground uh, for judicial review. And this is found in the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth, where in Section 52G of the ADJRA, it provides that an order of review can be sought in respect of an exercise of power that is so unreasonable that unreasonable that no reasonable person could have so exercised the power. So a, a uh, decision of the executive, therefore, may be attacked for being unreasonable, both under common law principles as well as under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. Uh, again, it is crucial to, again, just as a review, it is crucial to make a distinction between an application for judicial review under the common law and under the ADGR Act, because we must remember that an application for judicial review can only be made under the ADJR Act if what is involved is an administrative decision that is based on an enactment. So in other words, if an administrative decision is made and it is not based on an enactment because, for example, it involves the exercise of the prerogative powers of the executive, then the ADJR Act has no application. However, uh, as we said, under common law principles, judicial review may still be available even when the, uh, the action of the executive uh, is undertaken on the basis of prerogative powers and not a statutory grant of power, such as by an enactment. Now, the, the other thing we need to remember is that, in a way, in a way, it's actually possible to assert and argue that in the merit of an administrative decision, 
can actually be re-examined even under the ADJR Act outside and apart from the notion of its unreasonableness. And that is because it can be argued that under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, it also provides that an order of review can be sought in respect of a decision that was otherwise contrary to law, and that is according to Section 51J of the Act, as well as uh, any other exercise of a power in a way that constitutes abuse of the power. And again, that is based on Section 51E uh, of the ADJR Act. Now, based on these, either of these two provisions, it can, it can be argued, for example, that when a decision uh, lacks any evidence or there is an absence of evidence uh, when the decision was arrived at or, as we took up in uh, the previous week's topic, or when an administrative decision is founded on a fact that is critical to the decision, but that fact actually did not exist, then it might be argued that that decision was arrived at contrary to law. And therefore, uh, that decision uh, can be set aside under the ADJR Act. So in that case, a claim, therefore, that a decision was contrary to law or unlawful because of the absence of an evidence the notion, the idea that the evidence was absent touches upon the merits of a decision, does it not? In the same manner that it could be argued that when an, a power that is granted to the exec, executive ex, is, is exercised in a manner that constitutes an abuse of the power, it also touches upon the merits of the decision because then you're forced to examine the, uh, the factual scenario by which the power was exercised. Now, why is unreasonableness uh, actually a valid ground for judicial review? And the reason for this is that in the case, for example, of Minister for Immigration and Border Protection and Singh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal stated that there is a presumption of law that Parliament intends an exercise of, of power to be reasonable subject to the presence of a clear statutory qualification or contrary intention. So we must assume that as part of good administration and good government, it must be the intention of parliament and of the law that the exercise of power should always be reasonable. So therefore, if a power belonging to the executive has been exercised in an unreasonable manner, then it should be open to the courts to re-examine the validity or the legality of that decision for being unreasonable because uh, it is assumed that the law does not wish for a government power to be exercised unreasonably. And in the case, for example, of Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus Liz, Chief Justice French in the High Court uh, observed that lawfulness, fairness, and rationality lie at the heart of administrative justice so that when a decision for example is unfair or a decision seems to be irrational it goes against logic it goes against plain reason then it can be asserted that that goes against notions of administrative justice and therefore such a decision would be unreasonable which would therefore ground uh, an application for judicial review and but again we need to examine what rationality really means because as we later on mean it's not every decision that goes against logic that you can then assert that that decision is unlawful and therefore should be set aside. Uh, the, the, the standard uh, for judicial intervention is actually much, much higher than we would assume. In Kruger versus Commonwealth, the High Court also said that when a discretionary power is statutorily conferred on a repository, the power must be exercised reasonably for the legislature is taken to intend that the discretion be so exercised. So it just makes sense. You know, we would assume that the executive or even the parliament uh, will be exercising their powers in a reasonable manner because it seems to go against the notions of administrative justice and good administration and good uh, government for the uh, exercise of a power to be done unreasonably. Now, which brings us to the question, what unreasonableness in a decision amounts to an invalid administrative decision. Does it mean, therefore, that um, 
you, when somebody says, I find this decision to be unreasonable, does that mean, therefore, that uh, that is, in fact, a valid ground for such a decision to be set aside? When we say reasonable, unreasonable, do we view it from the viewpoint of uh, the applicant himself or herself? Or from the viewpoint of the standards of the community? Or is it from the viewpoint of the standards of the court? And in doing so, is there, is there a danger that uh, the notion of unreasonableness would actually obfuscate the legality merits distinction? So in other words, apart from knowing that if a question, that, that if an administrative decision is questioned on the basis of legality, because in that case it should go to the, to, uh, the courts for judicial review, and if a decision is questioned on its merits that should belong to a merits tribunal or an administrative tribunal, are we suggesting that there is another uh, ground for review on the basis of unreasonableness? And if, if that is the case, can it then be asserted that um, there is an area of review of administrative decisions that is based on unreasonableness, which doesn't hew quite well, uh, whether or not it pertains to legality or merits. And when we speak, for example, of unreasonableness, do we look at the substantive fairness of the decision or the factual adequacy or the factual support for such a decision? And how exactly is unreasonableness related to notions of illogicality and rationality? So these are uh, questions which we are trying to examine in this lecture podcast on when it's very unreasonableness. And uh, it is hoped that after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain and reasonableness, illogicality, and irrationality as grounds of judicial review, requirements to establish and reasonableness as a ground of judicial review, and fraud and bad faith as grounds of judicial review, which are, you know, fraud and bad faith are actually distinct grounds from judicial review, but are covered in this lecture podcast as well because uh, they seem to uh, talk about the outer limits of legality. So, going back, to the case of Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited versus Wednesbury Corporation, Lord Green, uh, the master of the roles, explained the notion of unreasonableness as a clown, as a common ground of judicial review. And he said that uh, if a decision on a competent matter is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could ever have come to it, then the courts can interfere. So let me repeat. Uh, in that case, and this is the classic formulation of the notion of Wendisbury and reasonableness, Lord Green, Master of the Role, said that if a decision by an administrative decision maker on a competent matter is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could ever have come to it, then the courts can interfere. But, he said, that for that to happen, it must be proved to be unreasonable in the sense that the court considered it, consider it to be a decision that no reasonable body could have come to. And this is not what the court considers unreasonable. It is that standard of a reasonable authority, not a reasonable person, as we might use in, uh, uh, in civil law, but a reasonable authority. So the reason why the standard of reasonableness is not dependent on the thinking of a court, according to Lord Green, is because the court may very well have different views to that of a local authority on matters of high public policy of this kind. So, in other words, when we speak of whether or not a decision is reasonable or not, and we speak of uh, assessing that or evaluating that from the viewpoint of a reasonable authority, we're looking at it from the viewpoint of uh, an executive, of another executive decision maker, or for that matter, a local authority, because a, a, uh, an executive decision maker does take into account matters of public policy, which courts in undertaking judicial review uh, do not consider because courts only look at the law. They, do, they don't look at uh, public policy, which belongs solely to the executive or the legislature. And uh, Lord Green uh, made, emphatically stated the difficulty in proving uh, witness brain and reasonableness by saying that to prove a case of that kind would require something overwhelming. So that in that case of Associated Provincial Picture, Houses Limited versus Witness Berry Corporation, as I said earlier, uh, the, uh, the Court of Appeals of the UK, 
through Lord Green, Master of the Rolls, uh, sided with the Wednesbury Corporation, which was the local authority, when the Wednesbury Corporation or the local authority uh, imposed a condition on the ability of the Associated Provincial Picture Houses Limited to open its cinemas on Sundays, where it imposed a condition that children under 15 years old may go to the cin- may, may not go to the cinema on Sundays, even when they were accompanied by an adult. And the court ruled that that was a reasonable uh, condition or imposition. And therefore, that specific condition or action uh, imposed by Wednesday Corporation, which was a local authority, uh, was deemed to not meet the standard of Wednesbury and reasonableness as to be the basis for the invalidity of such a decision. In Minister for Immigration versus Eshetu, Justice Gamo in the High Court warned against the loose usage of unreasonableness. So not every claim of unreasonableness has a legal significance or legal consequence. He said, Someone who disagrees strongly with someone else's process of reasoning on an issue of fact may express such disagreement by describing the reasoning as illogical or unreasonable, or even that it is so unreasonable that no reasonable person could adopt these. Adopt it. If these are merely emphatic ways of saying that the reasoning is wrong, then they may have no particular legal significance. So in that case, uh, such a decision which can be described or characterized loosely as being unreasonable would still not meet the standard of witness very unreasonableness as to invalidate such as, as to have that decision invalidated by a court in, uh, in a judicial review. Now, so how do we know what is unreasonable? What is unreasonable? Do we draw a correct? So when you say unreasonable, we're, we're, we're obviously talking of reason. And if you talk about reason, you talk about uh, rationality and logicality, the use of logic and the use of, of what is ration, of you know what the rational mind, and so we need to ask, uh, what's the connection between illogicality and and reasonableness? Are they one and the same? And what is the connection or the association between irrationality, illogicality, and unreasonableness? And in the cases of Minister for Immigration versus Eshetu and Re Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs ex parte applicants, S20-2002, uh, in the federal court, uh, both courts have pointed out that there is a close connection or association between illogicality and unreasonableness. And in fact, in the case of re-minister for immigration and multicultural affairs, ex parte applicants, S20-2002, uh, in, that, in that case, the federal court was prepared to accept that uh, irrationality and illogicality are potential freestanding grounds of judicial review apart from uh, the notion of unreasonableness. So um, on the one hand, it, it can be argued that unreasonableness can be examined on the basis from the viewpoint of whether or not it is irrational or illogical, but as a ground of uh, judicial review, uh, the court, the federal court was prepared to say that irrationality and illogicality are actually potentially freestanding grounds of judicial review. And the reason why uh, the court, the federal court, was prepared to arrive at this conclusion was because in this specific case of Remister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, the application for judicial review uh, had been made on the basis of the interpretation of the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs of the Migration of Act of 1958. And in that specific case, the Migration Act of 1958 uh, stated that recourse to the courts in a judicial review could only be undertaken uh, on the basis that the decision was irrational or illogical, but that uh, a judicial review could not be undertaken on the basis of a decision being unreasonable. So therefore, the Migration Act of 1958 contained what is known as a privative clause or a limitation of the power of the courts to review administrative decisions. And in that, uh, in the Migration Act of 1958, the, the, the specific statute provided that courts cannot examine a decision of the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs on the ground that the decision of such a minister was unreasonable. However, it was open 
to an applicant to question such a decision or the decision of the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs on the ground that it was irrational and illogical. So therefore, the applicant in this case argued that the decision was irrational and illogical, but couldn't argue that it was unreasonable. And because uh, the, the federal court allowed such an application to proceed, uh, it was then open to the court to, to have the view that rationality and illogicality, apart from the idea of unreasonableness, could become a freestanding uh, ground of judicial review. However, uh, we need to note that um, the Migration Act of 1958 was subsequently amended so that, uh, to, as of today, a decision of the Minister for Immigration could be questioned uh, for being unreasonable. So the, the privative clause that was then present in the act at the time that this case was filed uh, has already been removed. So the law has been amended so that now a decision can be reviewed by a court on the ground that the decision is unreasonable, which is a uh, provision, as we know, which can already be found in the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. Now, the High Court, however, uh, which obviously is a higher court and uh, in the hierarchy of the judicial system is able to uh, make a more definitive and binding uh, decision on the subject, uh, indicated that um, accepting irrationality as a freestanding common law requirement in decision making that may attract judicial view uh, may, may not be a correct viewpoint. So the high court indicated uh, that it wasn't prepared to accept irrationality as a freestanding common law requirement. In other words, it was prepared to accept that uh, when is very reasonableness could be the basis to invalidate an administrative decision, but it wasn't prepared to assert that irrationality as an independent ground, independent of the notion of when is very reasonableness, could actually be a ground for a review of an administrative decision. So, uh, going back to that idea, uh, is illogicality a freestanding ground? So uh, in uh, Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus SZMDS, Justices Crennan and Bell uh, stated their reservations about accepting irrationality as a freestanding common law ground. They said that describing reasoning as illogical or unreasonable or irrational may merely be an emphatic way of expressing disagreement with it, they also said that rationality is conventionally described as the quality of being devoid of reason. So therefore, illogicality is conventionally defined as unreasonableness. So that unreasonableness is conventionally defined as irrationality, which means, therefore, that the two words are actually interchangeable and, to a great extent, synonymous. So they're not different. They're actually synonymous. They're one and the same. And so, therefore, uh, the justices... Their honor said that uh, acknowledged that there is an undeniable semantic overlap between or irrationality, illogicality, and unreasonableness. So that decisions that talk of irrationality as a ground of judicial review assist in, in amplifying the notion of unreasonableness, but irrationality by itself uh, is not a freestanding ground for judicial review. Now, we therefore have to ask the question, what unreasonableness can invalidate a decision? So whether it's unreasonableness under the common law principles of witness Bay Corporation or unreasonableness as used in the ABJR Act. Uh, it should be pointed out that in Mr. for Immigration versus Ishetu, the High Court pointed out that there is a high hurdle in seeking to establish unreasonableness that invalidates an, in, an administrative decision. Uh, in fact, uh, Chief Justice Gleason also said in Re-Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs ex parte applicants, he also said that to describe reasoning as illogical or unreasonable or irrational may merely be an emphatic way of expressing disagreement with it. And so therefore, uh, there is a reluctance on the part of Australian courts to invalidate decision-making by applying the witness very standard. So while it may be open to uh, question the the kind of the merits of a decision on the basis that it uh, meets the threshold of witness very unreasonableness, it doesn't happen often. So that um, the court in Marrickville Metro Shopping Center Pro 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 Proprietary Limited versus Mar Marrickville Council said that the success 
of a challenge on the witness very and reasonable ground is confined to extreme cases involving demonstrably absurd decision. So it is there, but uh, it doesn't happen often. Uh, in uh, Avon Downs Proprietary Limited versus Federal Commissioner of Taxation, uh, Justice Dixon in the High Court stated that unreasonableness will only be established if the decision maker failed to address himself to the right question, incorrectly applied the rules of law, failed to take into account all the relevant considerations, and took into account irrelevant considerations. And you will notice that when a decision maker has failed to address himself to the right question, or incorrectly applied the rules of law, or failed to take into account all the relevant considerations and took into account irrelevant considerations, it is actually open to an applicant to argue that the decision uh, constitutes an error of law. So in that case, a, an administrative decision can actually be impugned on the basis of its being uh, an error of law without having to cite unreasonableness as a ground to attack the decision. But it has been recognized by Justice Dixon in that case of Avon Downs Proprietary Limited versus Federal Commissioner of Taxation that when you know, such a decision uh, is based on uh, the manner of decision making where the decision maker failed to address himself to the right question, that would constitute witness barrier and reasonableness as to invalidate a decision but at the same time, you should observe that if the decision maker did that, he would have committed an error of law, which is a separate ground for judicial review, apart from the notion of witness berry and reasonableness. Uh, in Minister for uh, Immigration and Citizenship versus SZMDS, Justices Crennan and Bell uh, also pointed out that illogicality or irrationality sufficient to give rise to jurisdictional error must mean the decision to which the tribunal came is one at which no rational or logical decision maker could arrive on the same evidence. And that an invalid decision is one that is clearly unjust or arbitrary or capricious or unreasonable in the, state, in the sense that the state of satisfaction mandated by the statute imports a requirement that the opinion as to the state of satisfaction must be one that could be formed by a reasonable person. And they warned that not every lapse in logic will give rise to jurisdictional error. And so therefore, they said that a court should be slow, although not unwilling, to interfere in an appropriate case. In Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus SZMBS, Justice Crenna and Bell also said that the test for illogicality and irrationality must be to ask whether logical or rational or reasonable minds might adopt different reasoning or might differ in any decision or finding to be made on evidence upon which the decision is based. Because if reasonable minds, whom we assume are logical or rational or reasonable, can adopt different reasonings or may have, a dif may have differences in arriving at a decision, then in that case, it would be difficult to argue that the decision is illogical or irrational. So you can only say that a decision would be illogical or irrational if logical or rational or reasonable minds will reach a unanimity that there is only one decision that could be arrived at. But if it is open for reasonable minds to disagree uh, on a decision that will only suggest that uh, any such a decision would actually be founded on reason or logic. And again, we must remember that not every claim of illogicality or irrationality will be a uh, sufficient basis to invalidate a, an administrative decision. Justice Crennan and Bell also pointed out that if property of evidence can give rise, therefore, to different processes of reasoning, and if logical or rational or reasonable minds might defer in respect of the conclusions to be drawn from that evidence, then a decision cannot be said by a reviewing court to be illogical or irrational or unreasonable simply because one conclusion has been preferred to another possible conclusion. So that a decision will not be logical or irrational if there is room for a logical or rational person 
to reach the same decision on the material before the decision maker. So let me repeat that. A decision will not be logical or irrational if there is room for a logical or rational person to reach the same decision on the, on the material before the decision maker. So in uh, Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus Asset, as an MTS, Justices Crennan and Bell said that a decision might be said to be illogical or irrational. Because, and remember that the court already said that there was a close connection or association between illogicality and irrationality with unreasonableness. So they're, they're synonymous and interchangeable. So the court in this case said that, the High Court in this case said that a decision might be said to be logical or irrational if only one conclusion is open on the evidence and the decision maker does not come to that conclusion, or if the decision to which the decision maker came was simply not open on the evidence, or if there is no logical co connection between the evidence and the inferences or conclusions drawn. So this bears emphasis. So the only time that a decision might be said to meet the standard of witness very unreasonableness for being illogical or irrational is if only one conclusion is open on the evidence. But if multiple conclusions or multi, uh, could, could be drawn on the basis of the evidence, it will be difficult to argue that such a decision or one of the decision or, or a decision uh, would meet the Wednesbury standard of unreasonableness or would be deemed illogical or irrational. A decision, as we said, can only be considered to be illogical or irrational as to cause its invalidation if there can only be one conclusion that is open on the evidence and the decision maker did not come to that conclusion. In Director of Animal and Plant Quarantine versus Australian Port Limited, the full federal court, uh, per Justices Heary and Lander said that the ultimate decision was not just unreasonable, but so unreasonable that no other similarly qualified decision maker would have made it. So in other words, the only time you can say that the decision would meet the Wednesbury standard of unreasonableness or the, or the standard of unreasonableness based on the EDGR Act would be that uh, it is so unreasonable that no other similarly qualified decision maker would have made it. But if uh, some similarly qualified decision maker would still arrive at such a decision, then it would be difficult to argue that the decision is, uh, meets the standard of unreasonableness as to cause such a decision to be invalidated by a court. Um, in Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus Lee, uh, the, the High Court said that unreasonableness uh, is actually related to other statutory grounds and which expresses a particular legal error. So that a decision affected by actual bias may lead to a discretion being exercised for an improper purpose or by reference to irrelevant consideration. So that when a decision uh, is affected by actual bias, you can say that that decision is unreasonable. You can also say that the exercise of such a discretion being exercised for an improper purpose or by reference to an irrelevant consideration is unreasonable. So in that case, you will notice the uh, close connection between unreasonableness and other statutory grounds uh, on which a claim can be made of a particular legal error of the administrative decision. It can also be said that the failure to accord natural justice, which as we know is the opportunity, opportunity to be heard, or the idea that uh, the decision maker should be free of actual bias, so that when uh, a decision maker fails to accord natural justice, it can also be said that such a decision by a decision maker would also be unreasonable. So that um, the uh, Chief Justice French in the High Court said, speaking of when this very unreasonableness, said that although a decision maker has kept within the four corners of the matters it sought to consider, they have nevertheless come to a conclusion so unreasonable that no reasonable statutory authority could ever have come to it. In, a, in such a case, the court may interfere. So again, I want to direct your attention to the fact that when we ask whose mind are we looking at to determine whether or not a decision is reasonable? Are we looking at the reasonable person, the man on the street? Is it the reasonable standard according to the community? Is it the reasonable standard according to the court? According to the 
according to, free, to Justice, uh, Chief Justice French and the Court of Appeal of the UK in the uh, Wednesbury case, the notion of unreasonableness uh, is determined by thinking about what a reasonable statutory authority would consider. And when we speak of a reasonable statutory authority, uh, we speak, for example, of the legislature or the executive, who typically consider uh, not just questions of law, but consider public policy as well. So when, they evaluate, so when, the, when an executive decision maker makes a decision, the executive decision maker not only looks at what the law provides, but he also takes into account pub public policy considerations as determined by law. Now, we can actually speak of three categories of unreasonableness, and in this case, we're going to give a few examples of what the courts have found to be instances of decisions which were invalid for being unreasonable. So there are three categories here. One, the decision lacks a plausible justification. Two, there is a capricious use of the power. And three, there is a discrimination without justification. So let's look at them uh, in detail. So when a, a decision, when is a decision uh, lacking in a plausible justification? So Lord Diplock said that a decision looked at objectively is devoid of any plausible justification that no reasonable body of persons could have received it. And uh, a decision may also lack a plausible justification if it is irretriev irretrievably wrong. In that case, you're, it's difficult to argue in a way that the, that the decision is correct. There's simply no way to be able to justify, in other words, such a decision because it is simply irre irretrievably wrong. And uh, a decision will also be unreasonable for lacking a plausible justification if, if the logic of the decision defies the known facts or explanation for the decision. And again, I want to point out to you the close connection between unreasonableness and the idea that a lack or absence of evidence would actually constitute an error of law. So that, in other words, if you were to be appearing before a, a court and apply for judicial review, it is uh, likely going to be uh, a proper way to identify all the potential grounds for an application for judicial review. So in other words, you don't limit yourself to a ground such as unreasonableness, but you would also assert a ground that a decision uh, constitutes an error of law or that there is no evidence to support a decision or that um, there is a jurisdictional error uh, in the decision of the, of the, of the decision maker. Having, uh, in other words, when you say that there is, for example, a jurisdictional error, you're actually saying that uh, the decision uh, is wrong because it goes against the jurisdiction of the court because if the court, I mean, if the decision maker were to properly exercise its power, it couldn't have arrived at such a decision. Now, another way by which you can claim Wednesbury or you can claim that a decision is so unreasonable that it should be invalidated by a court is when there is a capricious, capricious election of one of a number of powers open to an administrator in a given situation to achieve a desired objective. And yet, the choice of power in, the, in its exercise became capricious, capricious or inappropriate in the way that it was exercised and when it involves an invasion of the common rights of the citizen, whereas there are other powers that would not. So in other words, if an executive decision maker has multiple powers that are open to it in, in, uh, when it exercises such a power, and the exercise of a, of a power would end up in uh, invading the common law, law rights of a citizen. If it chooses, in other words, to invade the common law, law rights of a citizen, when it was open to the decision maker not to do so, when it was open to the decision maker not to invade the common rights of a citizen, then it would be considered that the exercise of such a power would be capricious and therefore inappropriate. And we're going to see this in the case of uh, Edelstein versus Wilcox, where the federal court in that case held as oppressive and unreasonable the decision of the Commissioner of Taxation, who used his power under the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936, to order the Health Insurance Commission to pay to the tax office 100% of any medical payments to owing to Dr. Edelstein without any notice. So that as a consequence, 
uh, Dr. Edelstein could no longer operate his business because any, pay, any monies that were meant to be paid for him were then um, garnished by uh, were then garnished by the uh, Commissioner of Taxation. When in fact, it was open to the Commissioner of Taxation not to exercise such a gargantuan power. And so the High Court, I mean the Federal Court said that when a power is exercised, there must always be advertence to the quality of fairness. In other words, power, a power must be exercised fairly. So even if a, an executive decision maker has the, power to, has the power to do something, the assumption is he must still exercise it fairly. And so therefore, if it's possible for him not to inflict punishment, he should avoid doing so. So the view of law, the view of law is that uh, the law is not to be intended to become an instrument of oppression, nor to be realized for a collateral purpose of extorting money from other sources, such as friends or, or relatives, nor by making it impossible for the taxpayer to continue to earn his living by the ordinary conduct of his business or profession. And the federal court also said that the law was never intended as a means for the infliction of punishment upon a taxpayer who in the past had adopted or was presently persisting in legal and permissible means for the limitation of liability to tax. So the, the third uh, category of uh, unreasonableness relates to unjustified unequal treatment so that uh, if there is discriminatory or unequal treatment with a justification, then it can be said that the decision would be invalid for being unreasonable. Now, what we need to remember is that not every discriminatory or uh, unequal treatment is impermissible. It is only when the discriminatory or unequal treatment is without any stated or rational justification would there be uh, a, an argument that there is an abuse of power which therefore leads to the power being exercised unreasonably. So in other words, it will be justified, for example, for the uh, administrative decision maker to discriminate according to age or sex or perhaps um, according to certain skills and qualifications or according to certain status of life uh, or the use of public policy may make him, may, may enable him to actually discriminate that would still be valid. So it is only when there is a discriminatory or, or unequal treatment and it cannot be justified on rational or stated grounds. Would there be an abuse of power? So finally, apart from unreasonableness, which as we said is uh, interchangeable and almost synonymous to the notions of illegality and irrationality, other grounds for judicial review would involve fraud and bad faith so that uh, bad faith and fraud are obviously closely linked to the requirements of natural justice and procedural fairness, which we know are already common law grounds of judicial review. The ADJR Act also provides that an order of review can be sought on the following grounds. Section 51G, for example, says that the decision was induced or affected by fraud. And uh, in Section 52D, that there was an exercise of a discretionary power in, a, in bad faith. Um, in SZFDE versus Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Lord Justice uh, Denning declared that fraud unravels everything. So the court is careful not to find fraud unless it is distinctly pleaded and proved. But once it is proved, it vitiates judgments, contracts, and all transactions whatsoever. Because imagine the effect of a decision being tainted by fraud. It is difficult to argue that a decision is valid even if it has been tainted by fraud, which is why uh, the court was emphatic in saying that fraud unravels everything. Uh, Justice Williams in the High Court also said in Farley, Australia, Proprietary Limited versus J.R. Alexander and Sons, that fraud is conduct which vitiates every transaction known to the law. It even vitiates a judgment of the court. It is an insidious disease, and if clearly proved, spreads to and infects the whole transaction. So you can just imagine the uh, the, effect, the legal effect of a fraud. You wouldn't. It's difficult to believe in a legal system where decisions could actually be tainted by fraud or acquired or procured on the basis of fraud. Now, bad faith 
is also a ground for judicial review. And uh, in SBBS versus Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs and Indigenous Affairs, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal uh, gave examples of what would constitute bad faith as a ground uh, for, I mean, the, the federal court um, indicated what would constitute bad faith as a ground for judicial review. And these are when a serious matter involving personal fault on the part of the decision maker exists, or there is uh, an allegation is not to be lightly made and it must be clearly alleged and proved. And that they also said that there are many ways in which bad faith can occur. Uh, the presence or absence of honesty will often be crucial so that if there is honesty, it will be difficult to argue that there is bad faith. And there are circumstances in which, and, and that the circumstances in which the court will find an administrative decision maker as having acted in bad, bad faith or in, as having not acted in good faith would actually be rare and extreme. And that mere error or irrationality does not of itself demonstrate lack of good faith. So in other words, just because there seems to be an error or irrationality in the reasoning of the decision maker doesn't mean that he was acting in bad faith. It only means that he committed an error, but in that case, that will not be a ground for judicial review. And bad faith is not to be found or attributed simply because of poor decision making. So you cannot uh, argue that uh, there was bad faith in a decision simply because uh, the way that the decision was crafted uh, reflected poor decision making. In that case, the federal court also said that there is a large step to jump from a decision involving errors of fact and law to a finding that the decision maker did not undertake its task in a way which involves personal criticism. Errors of fact or law and illogicality will not demonstrate bad faith in the absence of other circumstances which show capriciousness and so that the court must make a decision as to whether or not bad faith is shown by inference from what the tribunal has done or failed to do and from the extent to which the reasons disclose how the tribunal approached its task. And it is not necessary to demonstrate that the, the decision maker knew the decision was wrong. It is, however, sufficient to demonstrate recklessness in the exercise of the power. In uh, the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs versus SBAN, the Federal Court of Australia also said that inquiry in relation to bad faith, is directed to the actual state of mind of the decision maker. There is no such thing as deemed or constructive bad faith. So it must be actual but bad faith. Illogical find, factual findings or procedural blunders all the way will usually not be sufficient to base a finding of bad faith because such defects can be equally ex explicable as the result of obtuseness, meaning difficulty in arriving at a decision, overwork, forgetfulness, irritability, or other human failings which are not inconsistent with an honest attempt to discharge the decision maker's duty. So just because a decision maker seems to have committed a mistake, it will be difficult to argue that therefore uh, he made the decision in bad faith. Uh, but bad faith may manifest itself in the form of an actual bias, which is a state of mind so committed to a conclusion already formed as to be incapable of alteration, whatever evidence or argue, argument may be presented. So, and that would mean something more than a tendency of mind or predisposition. So when there is an actual bias, in other words, a decision maker has made, has arrived at a decision uh, in relation to a case before him, and that state of mind is likely to be unchangeable. In other words, the decision maker's mind is likely to be unmoved, and therefore his decision or his viewpoint on a subject is fixed. In that case, that would constitute an actual bias, which would then be a basis for a claim that there is bad faith in that decision. But the mere fact alone that the decision maker, for example, uh, has a preconceived idea as to what the decision might be, uh, in the way, for example, that he makes public statements, or that he may actually have a preferred view or even a bias uh, in relation to a particular subject, does not mean that there is actual bias. Because it's usual for every single person, for every person, to have a bias one way or another, or to form an opinion as to something. But it is only when a state of mind is unchangeable that it is incapable of presentation or, or alteration, whatever the evidence or argument may be presented, that it can be said that there is actual bias that, if then used, uh, would constitute bad faith, which then becomes a ground for judicial review. So uh, having said that, uh, in this lecture podcast, 
uh, we would have uh, covered the uh, following uh, objectives so that at the end of this lecture podcast, So that after starting this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain unreasonableness. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain unreasonableness, illogicality, and irrationality as grounds of judicial review, requirements to establish unreasonableness as a ground of judicial review, and fraud and bad faith as grounds of judicial review.